You know, they say the truth will make you free, but in my experience, it'll also break your heart and strip you naked. It might even make you go bald. <laughs> the naked truth is pretty scary. Most naked things are. Can you guys imagine if I just took off all my clothes right now? I know this is a shock, but that's actually not been photoshopped. <laughs> and I do want to get naked, figuratively speaking. I want to talk about marriage. I'll start with the good news. My wife and I just celebrated our 20th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I'm going to be real, though. Staying married is the hardest thing I've ever done. Now, our theme for today is connections, and to connect with people, you've got to be vulnerable. So, can I get vulnerable with you all? Do I have your permission? Okay, good. So, the bad news. Um, a few years ago, my wife left me. She did. It was just me and the kids. And now she's back, and I want to tell you how we stayed married. Okay, so, in the U.S., most marriages start at 30, and the average lifespan is 77, which means if you can stick it out, most marriages should last 47 years. It sounds like a lot, but not really. According to my good friend ChatGPT, that's basically the lifespan. <laughs> no, we're super good friends. I asked ChatGPT, and he said, you know, that's the lifespan of a donkey. <laughs> Look at this little donkey. He wants you to stay married, and so do I. The first thing you've got to do is be insane. Now, <laughs> getting married is not insane. Getting married is fun. This is my wife, Lauren, on our wedding day. You know, if you had told me everything that would happen, I still would have done it. I still would have gotten married. This is a photo of me taken around the same time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's unfair that a woman who was homeschooled could be this beautiful. But underneath all that beauty was a hilarious hypochondriac who couldn't stop making jokes about her own death. You know, when we were dating, she wrote the funniest letters. I actually still have all of them. She asked me not to read them aloud today, so I've made copies to pass out later. <laughs> she wrote things like, I had an aneurysm today and thought of you. Or, I had 16 heart attacks at the grocery store. She also gave the sweetest compliments. She once told me I had the largest head she's ever seen. <laughs> they never tell you that hot people are just as weird as the rest of us. We were funny because we were sad. We don't look sad in the photo, but we were. You know, the usual stuff, uh, family things, you know, personal loss, that kind of thing. Our jokes were a way to deal with pain. But pretty soon they became a way to inflict pain. She made fun of me, so I made fun of her, which was easy since she was homeschooled. <laughs> but we had a pretty good life. We had three beautiful kids, but we kind of grew apart. And then she kind of fell in love with someone else. That's why she left. Betrayal. It's a white hot light that refracts a rainbow of pain. Shock rage, despair, and yet weirdly you feel superior too. I'm not perfect, but at least I've never done that. It's not a great feeling. I actually made a list of every terrible thing my wife had ever done. The lies, the secrets, the broken promises. Love keeps no record of wrongs, but hate writes them down. Hate remembers. I did not like the way the hate made me feel. I prayed, I got advice. Some people said, you know, this isn't about you which just made me feel worse. Imagine telling this to a stabbing victim. This isn't about you. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just be over here dying, feeling great that I did not cause the stabbing. Another friend encouraged me to fight for my marriage, and I wanted to. I didn't want a divorce. I wanted my wife back. A uh, therapist actually said, you know, in cases like this, if a marriage is going to recover, then both spouses usually have to own their part in it. He wasn't saying, I caused the affair, but he was saying it might be useful to look in the mirror. And not just any mirror. I'm talking about one of those mirrors in a Walmart dressing room, because those mirrors do not lie to you. <laughs> so I stopped making a list of everything terrible about my wife, and I made a list of everything terrible about me. And it was really long. 
I'm abrasive. I brag. I'm so good at bragging. <laughs> I interrupt others constantly. I say I care about people, but I don't even have the decency to remember names. I've lived next to my neighbor for 10 years, and I can tell you for a fact that her name is either Janet, Joy, Cheryl, or Brenda. <laughs> Here's the thing. I was a pretty good husband. I paid the bills, provided for my family, played with my kids. But here's the other thing. I'm also kind of a monster. I mean, look, I've got a foot for a hand. <laughs> At some point in every marriage, you've got to own up to the truth. You are not easy to live with. Maybe you're cruel, maybe you're indifferent. Only when you see your own monstrosity can you grow up. And I had some growing up to do. I was now a single parent with three young kids in the house, and I was pretty sure their mom was never coming home. Separation was hell. I cried so hard one night I woke up with abs. <laughs> I went to some pretty dark places, places I hadn't been to in a long, long time, like the grocery store. <laughs> did you guys know they have sushi at the grocery store now? And did you know that kitchen floors have to be swept every day? Because I didn't. Fortunately, I own an amazing broom. <laughs> and the hair. My kids have so much hair. I, I don't know anything about hair. I have not had hair since Bill Clinton was president. <laughs> to fight for my marriage, you know what I did? I fought the hair. I fought the toilet bowls. I beat the crap out of the laundry. I bought small dry erase boards. I wrote out meal plans and chore assignments. And I asked for help, too, from God, from my church, and from my children, who decided it was probably safer just to do each other's hair. <laughs> These are uh, two of our girls. You know, in the midst of this hardest of years, I saw so much love in them, for me, for each other. I saw love in our church. I saw love in our community. Sometimes you don't see all the love until everything around you goes dark. So... This is the part of the story where I'm supposed to tell you that I finally learned to love myself. How I felt pride in my ability to be strong in the midst of the most heartbreaking season of my life. But I think what I needed to do was maybe love myself a little less and maybe learn to love others a little more. Like my kids, my friends, and my wife. She was still my wife. One day I called her. We hadn't talked in forever. And I said, you know, I've been a terrible husband. And she said, I've been a terrible wife. And then the craziest thing happened. Nothing. <laughs> Nobody made a joke. It's like everything we had ever done to hurt one another filled that silence. It's like we could finally see each other for the first time. And then she said she wanted to come home. Okay, so what do I do? The book of Micah says to do justice and love mercy, which always sounded like a paradox. Justice is not merciful and mercy is not just. But there on the phone with my wife, I think I finally got it. I think what it means is you have to keep your eyes wide open about how broken and awful people can be. You, me, her, all of us. And you have to love them anyway. You have to leave the door open for love even when people hurt you. This is the paradox of wedding vows. When you get married, you're basically agreeing to be okay with being hurt. And so are they. It's wild. It's like you're making an impossible promise. And then you have the audacity to try and keep it. Well, I wasn't quite done trying to keep it yet. So I went and got in my truck and I went to go get my wife. We found an amazing therapist. We slept in separate beds for a very long time. We made it to one week, then one month, then a year, then two, each day slightly less weird than the day before. You know, rebuilding broken trust is a little bit like rebuilding someone's face after a disfiguring chainsaw accident. <laughs> it can be done, but it'll look different for a while, maybe forever. Until one day it looks mostly normal or you stop noticing the scars or caring much when you do. We both changed a lot. 
our marriage is now radically progressive. For example, I do a million times more housework than before. But the best thing, the best thing about our new marriage is that my wife no longer has a boyfriend. <laughs> In that sense, it's more traditional. <laughs> you know, G.K. Chesterton said, angels can fly because they can take themselves lightly. Y'all, life is heavy. Being bitter, that's easy. But laughing, like learning to laugh again despite the heaviness, that is hard. And that, in my opinion, is the real secret to staying married. There is so much more to say. So much that we actually wrote a book. People have asked why we would write such a scandalous story, and I don't really know what to say. We did not write this book for money. We wrote it for what the money will allow us to buy. <laughs> Maybe a little donkey. I, I don't even know how much donkeys cost. But I know this. The truth has stripped us naked and set us free. It has. We want the world to know that a dead marriage can live again if you are insane enough to try and brave enough to fight the monster you see in the mirror. You can't do it alone. I am so grateful to all the people who helped us through our nightmare. I could give you guys a hundred names. Names like Soren, Jason, Jimbo, Janet, Joy, Cheryl, and or Brenda. <laughs> a lot has changed but we're still funny. We used to laugh at each other, and now we laugh with each other at other people. <laughs> Big difference. Earlier today, when I asked her how I looked for this talk, she said, you know, I really hate that mustache. And you know what I said? I said, well, I love yours. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. My wife does not have a mustache. I don't really have a foot for a hand. That's one of our daughters. You know, I think often of our girls and what they've learned of love in this strange season. I suppose we've given them enough trauma to turn all three into writers. But we're still here, a nuclear family, detonated but not destroyed. We won't be traumatizing our girls with our divorce. We'll traumatize them with our marriage as God intended. <laughs> Thank you.